For God so loved the world. We all know what that means, right? John 3.16 is the single best-known verse in the entire Bible. It can be found still at baseball games and on billboards and even in graffiti. Everybody knows this verse. And everybody knows what it means, right? That's why it's so doggone hard to understand. This most famous verse occurs in the context of Jesus' late-night conversation with Nicodemus the Pharisee. The circle that Nicodemus runs with doesn't much care for Jesus. And throughout St. John's Gospel account, they frequently end up on the other side of the aisle from him. Nicodemus, perhaps in defiance of his crew, or maybe with their, um, with their support as a back-channel negotiator, comes to Jesus in the middle of the night, trying to figure out more about what he's teaching. But when Jesus tries to explain it to Nicodemus, it all goes over his head. Jesus speaks of being born again, and Nicodemus scratches his head and wonders, can Jesus actually be suggesting that he should crawl back into his mother's womb so that he can be born a second time? Nicodemus' problem is that he knows too much. All that stuff that he knows is getting in the way of his understanding. Perhaps it's for this reason that among Christians, faith and belief have become a convenient shorthand as an opposite to fact and knowledge. Since we can't reason our way to Jesus and salvation, we just have to believe it. And for those who can't believe it or won't believe it, either because this all seems a little too fanciful or because they belong to another faith tradition, well, that's just too bad. They're condemned. That's just the way that works, right? End of story. We know this. It's what the Bible says right there in black and white. Isn't it? Let me propose for you an alternative. What if, what if Jesus is actually talking about God's hope for us to find a fuller life here and now by learning another way to live, Jesus' way of generous living and reckless compassion and self-sacrifice? What if Jesus is actually proposing that this way of life is open to anyone, regardless of their faith tradition or even their lack thereof? That goes against everything we know about these verses. But what if it's true? Let's consider this for a moment. Jesus' words are in the context of this rather odd story from Numbers, right? In that story, a person who is bitten by a snake is condemned, right? They're doomed to die. Unless they look at this bronze serpent that Moses put on a pole, in that case, they'll live. Now, that seems like an odd solution, right? Wouldn't it make much more sense for God to simply remove the snakes or maybe to make people immune to the poison? And, but in order to be saved, the people have to look at the image of the thing that's killing them. They have to look at the serpent. And I can't help but notice what people say to Moses as they plead for relief. They say, we have sinned by speaking against God and against you. They recognize that it's their own behavior that's hurting them. It's what they have done that's brought about this evil. The story says that God sent the snakes, but we've got to remember that in that time and in that place, it was taken for granted that God did everything like that, whether it was good or bad. If we can look past that ancient and somewhat, frankly, obsolete worldview, we find that the people recognize that their grumbling is poisoning their community as surely as a pack of vipers. 
their simmering resentments and their whispered accusations against Moses and God are like vipers among the grass. Sibilant whispers passed from one ear to another, poisoning hearts with anger and fear and despair. That kind of evil is pervasive. It doesn't just go away. You can't just wave a hand and make it disappear. The only way to be healed is to acknowledge the harm that's being caused and to take steps to repair it. You gotta look at the serpent in order to be healed. Jesus likens himself to that bronze serpent that Moses hoisted on the pole. He shows us the evil that is poisoning us and offers us a solution by means of recognizing and repairing that evil. This is the judgment, he says, that the light came into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Doesn't that sound familiar? That evil is what condemns us, what dooms us to die, not God. It's the poison coursing through our veins, slowly stopping our hearts and paralyzing our minds. One question to ponder, then, is what this evil might be upon which Jesus is shining a light. According to St. John, Jesus tries again and again to shine a light into the darkness, but people, even the most religious people, are unable to see because they are blinded by what they know to be true. Like Nicodemus, they are unable to see, to let go of their preconceptions and their prejudices that they bring to their relationship with God. And so they come to see Jesus as a threat rather than a messenger of abundant life because he doesn't fit their expectations. He doesn't fit with what they know to be true about God. And so they choose their beliefs over trusting in Jesus' good news. Now, belief is a funny and dangerous word. The Greek word that St. John uses in this story can just as easily be translated trust. That's a small distinction, but clearly it's important. Because in English, believing is an academic exercise. It's all in your head. It's about accepting or adhering to a tenant or a doctrine. Our beliefs become a part of our identity, a part of who we are. And that's why the Pharisees can't hear what Jesus has to say, because doing so would destroy a part of their identity. It would destroy a sen their sense of their own Jewishness. It becomes a kind of a death. Trust, on the other hand, is different. Trusting isn't something we do with our heads, it's something we do with our guts or our hearts. When the people in the wilderness look on the bronze serpent for healing, they aren't believing in it. They're trusting that this remedy will work. It's an act of faith, but a different kind of faith. And maybe even if they don't believe that it will work, if it seems utterly ridiculous that looking at a bronze serpent could heal a snake bite, well, maybe they try it anyway, because what have you got to lose? But when it works, when their lives are preserved, then they begin to trust that the God who told them this will work might actually be worth listening to. So I can't help but wonder if by making these verses about religious adherence, we are making the same mistake the Israelites make. That bronze serpent, you know, traveled through the, through the wilderness with those people to the promised land. After the temple was built, it was kept there. As time passed, people began making offerings to it. They began worshiping it. In other words, Rather than trusting it to work as God said it would, they began to believe in it. It makes me wonder, could it be that believing in Jesus in this way can be just as harmful? 
Maybe what this story calls us to do is not to believe, but rather to trust. What makes Jesus so hard for, for the religious leaders to accept may just be the very thing that we are supposed to trust. He heals, but he does it on the Sabbath. He comes from God, but he hangs out with sinners. He destroys the temple by disrupting the sacrificial system. He claims God's authority for his own. He calls himself the light of the world, which the religious leaders can't seem to see, and the bread of life, indicating that we should eat his flesh and drink his blood, and the good shepherd, in opposition to the leaders shepherding God's people now. The priests and the scribes and the Pharisees all see him disrupting everything. They see him as dangerous. And so they do the only thing they know how to do. They reject him and they kill him. And that is what we see when we see Jesus lifted up. We see the way that we solve our problems with violence and rejection. Like that bronze serpent, Jesus is making us look at those very problems that tear us apart, at violence and rejection. Can you see the irony in using this text, or in any biblical text, to reject someone who doesn't believe the same thing we do, to say that they don't have a place in God's heaven, just as the leaders of Jesus' time rejected him for not believing the same things they did? But according to St. John, the joke is on us. Because when we lifted Jesus up on the cross to kill him, God was also lifting him up, but in a different way. He wasn't just lifted up on a cross, he was also raised on the third day. He also ascended into heaven. I think the message here might be that Jesus, that the way Jesus lived and died is actually the way to abundant life. Life that is heavenly. Our way of life, our way marked by defensiveness and violence and rejection is killing us. We are condemned already because of this poison working in our veins. But the way of Jesus' life, his message of God's unconditional love, his solidarity with those on the margins, his refusal to reject even those who sought to kill him, his self-giving love for his friends and his enemies alike. That way of life is so life-giving that even crucifixion can't end it. And so I'm left wondering, what if that is what this whole story is about? Not conversion, not sacrificial death, not heaven and hell, but trust in a way of life that is as absurd as trying to claw your way into an elderly woman's uterus, and yet somehow also eternal. Maybe Jesus isn't trying to save us from God's wrath or from justice or punishment at all. But rather, maybe God is trying to save us from ourselves. Because God loves us, all of us, the whole world, so much that God sent God's own Son, even knowing that we would kill him for trying to save us. I can't read this story and come away thinking that non-believers are doomed because they're of their lack of faith. I can read this story and think that there are maybe people out there who are not Christian, maybe not even religious, that trust Jesus more than some Christians because they trust in that divine love more than in the doctrines or the tenets of any particular faith. I can't say that I know for sure what this story means but I do know that that lack of knowledge does not shake my trust in the grace and in the mercy of a love so powerful, so complete, that it offers itself freely to the violence and the rejection of the world in the hope 
that the world might look upon it and be changed by it, maybe even saved by it.